Comets are regular visitors to the inner solar system. Some are spectacular, known as great comets, which are visible to the naked eye, sometimes stretching across a huge portion of our sky. However, most comets come and go without much of a fuss, not visible to the naked eye, and we wouldn't even know about them were it not for telescopes constantly monitoring sections of our sky. It is thought that there are billions of comets in our solar system. Comets come in three categories, short, intermediate, and long periods. Short period comets orbit as far out as Jupiter. Intermediate comets can be found around the orbit of Neptune and into the Kuiper belt. And many more beyond that are found in the Oort cloud, which are known as long period comets. Comets tend to have very elliptical orbits with most taking tens of thousands of years to make one orbit around the Sun. Due to their tiny size and huge distance from us, most only get discovered when they approach the Sun in their orbits. Volatile material on their surface, like water and carbon dioxide ices, heat up upon approach, subliming into space with some force, producing the bright coma and tails comets are famous for. This makes their detection a lot easier for astronomers but once they whip around the sun and head back out towards the outer solar system, we often never see them again, not in our lifetimes anyway. Most of the great comets we see are long period comets, meaning we'll only see them once in their millennia long orbits. All except for one, Halley's Comet. While Halley's Comet is an intermediate period comet, every orbit has always produced a fantastic spectacle to those observing it making it the only intermediate period great comet. Its orbit takes roughly 75 years, meaning someone could see it twice in their lifetime. And incredibly, there have been records of Halley's Comet dating all the way back to 467 BC. With the regularity and predictability of it lighting up our night skies, it was no surprise that as it was approaching in the 1980s, Many space agencies scrambled at the chance to get a close-up look of a great comet's nucleus for the very first time. And the result? Something known as Halley's Armada. I'm Alex McColgan and you're watching Astrum, and together we will investigate the story of Halley's Armada, plus what it did and what it discovered around the comet Halley. The Halley Armada is the unofficial name of five separate missions from three different space agencies that all approached Halley at roughly the same time. One probe, called Giotto, was an ESA mission. Vega 1 and 2 came from a joint venture between the Soviet Union and France, and the final two, Suisai and Sakigake, came from ISIS, later to be known as JAXA, or the Japanese Space Agency. Each of them has a pretty interesting story. We'll start with Vega 1 and 2. These Vega missions were primarily designed to drop off probes at Venus, but it was determined that the mothership portion of the mission could be redirected using Venus's gravity to do a flyby of Halley if it was timed just right. This gravity assist would prove useful not just because of the speed boost the probes gain from the Venus flyby, but the redirection was particularly important as Halley has a rather unconventional orbit which makes a rendezvous very tricky. Its orbit is highly elliptical, is retrograde compared to the planets in our solar system, and is inclined by 18 degrees to the ecliptic, meaning most of the time it is under or south of the solar system's plane. These two probes are twins, identical spacecraft that launch within days of each other from Kazakhstan. They arrived on the 6th and the 9th of March 1986 respectively. These two probes, while perhaps not the highlight of the Armada, collected a host of data, including photos of the nucleus, observations of its temperature, its surface properties, and composition of the coma. They both flew by Halley at a distance of only 8,000 kilometers, but interestingly, their positioning data was then passed on to the Giotto team due to be arriving a few days later which allowed them to increase the accuracy of their flyby, meaning Giotto could fly past Halley at an altitude of only 600 kilometers. 
But before Giotto arrived, the Japanese space agency's probes were approaching. This was Japan's first deep space mission, and as such, the Suesai and Sakigake probes were quite basic, and the missions were more about a demonstration of the launch vehicle rather than the probes themselves. Sakigake was launched first and didn't even have a camera on board, but instead had instruments to measure magnetic fields and plasma in interplanetary space. Upon the success of the Sakigake probe, Suasai was launched a few months later, but this time with an imaging system and a solar wind detecting instrument. Japanese scientists were interested in the comet's huge coma, which was imaged continuously as Suasai passed through it on the 8th of March, at a distance of 150,000 kilometers from the comet nucleus. Even at this far distance, Suasai hit two dust particles during its flyby. Sakigake observed from a much greater distance of 7 million kilometers at its closest approach on the 11th of March. Then it was Isa's turn. On the 13th of March, Giotto made the most ambitious flyby yet. Equipped with a color camera, scientists were keen to get their first close-up view of a comet's nucleus. Flying only 600 kilometers over a very active comet, scientists were worried that the spacecraft wouldn't survive. As such, all of the most important scientific instruments were tucked into the body of the probe as much as possible, with a shield at the front to protect it from collisions. As Giotto approached, it took many pictures, and in this motion interpolated video of those images, this is what it saw. For the 1980s, this view is pretty incredible. Just after this approach, however, and just as scientists feared, Giotto was hit by some particles which sent it spinning out of control, meaning its antenna was no longer pointed at Earth. For an agonizing 35 minutes, the mission controller's screen showed no contact with the probe. But then, as perhaps hope seemed lost, contact. Giotto had stabilized itself again and re-established contact with Earth, sending back the valuable data it had collected. Giotto largely survived the encounter, although a particle had struck and disabled the camera on board, but thankfully not before it had taken images of its closest encounter. So what did all these missions discover about Halley? Well, the main thing that surprised scientists greatly was that Halley was a lot darker than they anticipated, as dark as coal. It was so dark, in fact, that it was beyond the limitations of the camera to distinguish details. The image you are seeing here is the result of serious image processing that bring out details from the original images. Also, only a small portion of the comet seems to be outgassing, seen mainly around these beams here. This contradicted the dirty snowball theory regarding comets, instead this data indicated comets were more like snowy dirt balls. The Armada also discovered that the comet's coma and tail included mainly water ice, but also carbon dioxide, methane, ammonia, plus iron, hydrocarbons and sodium. The dusty particles are likely caught up in the jets as the comet outgasses, blasting them away from the comet and into the tail. It's the dust particles ejected from comets that we see as shooting stars. That is how scientists are able to predict when meteor showers are likely to happen as we can predict when Earth will pass through the remnants of a comet's tail. The brightness of the coma is due to the sunlight being absorbed and re-radiated by the ejected ices, and, to a lesser extent, due to the reflection of the sunlight of the dust particles. So, the brightness of a comet depends on how much it outgasses as it approaches the sun. Scientists also found Halley to be very fluffy with a density of only roughly 0.6 grams per centimeter cubed. So it's likely to be porous or even like a rubble pile. Measurements showed that Halley's surface temperature was between 27 and 127 degrees Celsius, meaning only 10% of the surface was active as these missions passed by. But perhaps the most astounding discovery of all was the deuterium ratio found in its water ices. Scientists up until recently believed that comets are the source of water found on Earth. But this comet, and again with Churumov-Gerasimenko, 
have shown that this likely isn't the case. The deuterium ratio, or the key indicated to show whether water shares the same origin or not, is different between water found on Earth and water found on comets. This likely means we need a new theory regarding where Earth's water comes from. Perhaps asteroids could be the next option. So there we have it, the Halley Armada, an ambitious multinational project to examine a frequent visitor to the inner solar system, which uncovered a wealth of information about the outer solar system and the role of comets in the Earth's formation. And remember to make sure you have 2061 in your calendars for when Halley comes by again. It promises to be a fantastic spectacle and you wouldn't want to miss it. Find it incredible how scientists can calculate the trajectory of probes accurately enough to come within a few hundred kilometers of a comet hurtling through space. It's all to do with classical mechanics and gravitational physics, subjects which don't have to be as out of reach as you may think. Brilliant has a bunch of interactive and engaging courses for aspiring people that break down maths, physics and computer sciences in a compelling way that can help you get a deeper understanding for the universe and my videos. If you want to try it out, you can sign up for free today by using the link brilliant.org forward slash astrum and that link will also get you 20% off their annual premium subscription to get unlimited access to all of Brilliant's interactive math, science and computer science courses. Thanks for watching. I've been looking forward to making this video since I first learned about the Armada. Want more old missions? Let me know in the comments. Thanks to everyone who likes and subscribes, and a big thanks to my patrons and members who support the channel. If you would like to support too, find the links in the description. All the best, and see you next time.